Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program brought to you by Kensington and Chelsea Libraries. We continue with our Fantasy February Festival of Folklore and Customs this evening uh, with a talk on Torlonia marbles um, delivered by Olga Chuchkovic, who is no stranger to our program. She has already um, done a couple of sessions with the libraries on Rome, uh, Dubrovnik and Villa Borghese, Gallery Borghese. Olga is a licensed tour guide of Rome and the Vatican City and has managed tours in Italy, Central Europe, Croatia, Bosnia for over 30 years, working for one of the best US tour operators for luxury travel. Um, um, she works as a coordinator and a guide and specializes in private tours for families and individual custom made itineraries. Um, she's a lover of art. She obtained her master's degree in arts management at the American University of Rome last year and is pr um, rightly proud of her TEFL certificate, which, which she won during the lockdown. Um, she's a great friend and I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome and introduce to you Olga Chuchkovic. Well, hello everyone. Good evening. And here we are with the story about this extraordinary exhibition that's um, taking place in Rome. It's been decades or half a century in making and uh, finally the famous family Torlonia has made a deal with the Italian Ministry of Cultural Heritage. So I would like to give you a little background on the family and how they managed to arrive to having the most extraordinary private collection of antiquities. We're talking about 620 statues in the former Torlonia Museum and also about the Fondazione or the foundation where they still house some amazing works of art, antiquities always, and it's only open uh, uh, for visits if you make a reservation, but they give you the date. I mean, I'm talking about normally how that works. Well, Torlonia is a family that arrived to Rome a little bit over 200 years ago. And I would like to start with uh, the coat of arms, which they came up with. We see the rosebuds, uh, roses budding and uh, a comet. So that would be uh, the description of the family in uh, symbols. So uh, Marino Torlonia comes from France, their French family originally in the 1764 as uh, a special um, servant, not really a servant, but let's say personal assistant to a cardinal. And um, the cardinal bequeathed some property to his uh, favorite sort of a butler. And very soon the family has a small bank, lends money, they don't only deal with the uh, textile as uh, merchants, but they venture into many other businesses. So they start acquiring uh, properties, land, and very soon they acquire the titles of dukes, marquises, uh, um, and princes, uh, both by the Pope and later by the King Victor Emmanuel. So Torlonias, here is a little close up of that new coat of arms. New for Rome, you know, 200 years is uh, very nouveau rich for Rome. But uh, we must be aware that at that time, a lot of noble families were impoverished already. They had titles, but they uh, did not have cash anymore. So they would take loans and then eventually they would pay them with the works of art, with their collections uh, or the land. So uh, here we are in the um, uh, Parco degli Aquedotti, the Park of the Aqueducts, which uh, was entirely owned by the Torlonia family. Uh, part of the land, of course, was expropriated in the more modern times. And it's not the only area they, they owned, but I just would like to show you uh, how these neighborhoods look like. They also owned uh, the land where there is today the airport of uh, Fiumicino, then the Porto, the port, the old harbor of uh, Ostia. They were buying ecclesiastical properties and uh, uh, they were not really that nice to the peasants. So there was a saying, it was actually written by a novelist, uh, at the head of everything is God. After him comes Lord Torlonia, then comes his armed guards, then their dogs, then nothing at all, nothing at all, and then the peasants, and that's all. 
And uh, there was a popular movie in Italy, a cult movie, uh, Romanzo Criminale, uh, like the novel about crime, where a boss, it was about um, happening in the 1970s, while entering in his luxurious car, he says, only Torlonia and I in Rome own this kind of car. So we're talking about that kind of wealth. And uh, if you walk around the countryside and uh, you see a little tiny farmhouse somewhere, it might as well be uh, a pretty run down from outside uh, Torlonia property. But be sure that nearby uh, there are some ancient Roman roads, uh, tombs, uh, uh, temples, uh, where during the whole 1800s, they did a lot of excavations and a huge part of the exhibition we're going to see will be the, the statues and busts that come from those excavations. And they were not only excavating and buying properties, but they also built properties. So uh, this is um, Villa Torlonia, which is the today uh, museum. It was abandoned after the Second World War. And it was bought from another noble family, Colonna, with which they eventually intermarried as well. And this is where uh, Mussolini lived uh, between um, 25 and 43. There's also a uh, shelter and uh, like uh, anti-atomic shelter and the bunker, which are visitable normally today. It was completely restored in 2006. It was rented to Mussolini uh, by the Torlonias uh, for a symbolical amount of one lira, to be like one cent. And this is where Mussolini uh, watched movies. Many famous artists were involved uh, in decorating the palazzo and a lot of neoclassical, uh, sort of like we could say fake Roman, but neoclassical uh, art that recalls those Greek Roman uh, classicist times. Uh, this is a huge space uh, with also a uh, theater because they loved parties, uh, the nobility would participate, they would make great, uh, uh, great connections for their bank, especially Banco Torlonia, later known as Banco del Fucino. We'll get back to that. During the story, there's also a bit of fake Middle Ages. This is a lovely museum actually today. And uh, uh, not just that, but for the good measure, some fake Roman ruins as well. Their main uh, uh, love has always been uh, uh, ancient art, Greek and Roman, as we will see. In the neighborhood, not far away, I uh, found this engraving by Piranesi. Uh, there is a Villa Albani, which is today the seat of the foundation. It was built by a cardinal Albani, it took him about 50 years. Uh, he was a nephew of a pope, which helps a lot with the, with the real estate. And uh, he had some special collaborators, not just Piranesi, who made this engraving, but also Winkelmann, the father of art history, who classified the periods of, uh, of art of that time. He was his private uh, librarian. And this is where Cardinal uh, housed his collection of art. And uh, still today, nobody really lives in Villa Albani. And they have something that all the historians, archaeologists are dying to see, the frescoes from the fourth century BC, from the tomb uh, known as Francois by the archaeologist who discovered it. And uh, uh, this uh, Charon is uh, guarding it so well that the Torlonias were offered 7 million euro to show, to give them to a state-run museum. They refused. Why would they not refuse? You see, their wealth was estimated on about 2 billion euro. Now, in the past, they also owned uh, a hotel in Gilterra, England, and uh, this is where a lot of the um, visitors who came on Grand Tour would stay. And let's not forget, uh, some of the Torlonias uh, uh, went to London uh, to school, which was uh, very far advanced, far sighted, and because the official language was French, but they knew English will be important. And uh, uh, most of these uh, well-off visitors uh, were the clients of the Torlonia uh, Bank. And they also embellished the streets of Rome. Uh, they also had some charitable institutions, I must say. They, they were members of the family who also did a lot of, a lot of good things as well for the, for the community. So Marino Torlonia embellished uh, uh, this corner. He was their official residence still, just uh, across the street. But now they were embellishing their palaces. Here we are at the Piazza Venezia, the main square, right next to the famous monument of uh, Vittoriano. 
And uh, today this is the seat uh, of uh, Assicurazioni Generali, which is the insurance company, but it was the Palazzo which they bought in the early 1800s and it was demolished to uh, modernize the whole uh, neighborhood and this is where they kept uh, also amazing collection of art. Some has been uh, saved, it's uh, distributed between the different museums and especially famous, extraordinary is this uh, uh, Hercules and Laika, but it's not uh, an antique one, it's Canova, uh, the most famous uh, sculptor of the neoclassical period and uh, uh, it's nine tons of, of a statue and it's now in the gallery of modern art in, uh, in Rome Extraordinary. Uh, also an homage to Veiled Christ in, uh, in Naples. As uh, Canova said, I would give 10 years of my life to be able to sculpt like that. And uh, uh, this castle is not Torlonia, not owned by the Torlonia. By, it was owned by the Piccolomini family, but this is where there is a museum that houses a collection of archaeological finds owned by the Torlonia once upon a time, because what we see uh, in the far end is the valley that once upon a time used to be the uh, third largest uh, uh, lake in Italy, Fucino. And uh, it flooded tremendously in the past, does not have, did not have natural emissaries, so even Roman emperors got involved and uh, Claudius built a tunnel to regulate the, the height of the lake, but Torlonius in the 1800s drained the lake entirely, turned it into fertile soil, divided it into um, hundreds of little farms and rented to the peasants or, or sharecroppers. This was all expropriated uh, in 1952 but resulted in the process in a lot of finds like these are the most uh, famous little, little pieces showing ancient cities and uh, and the temples now having so much art uh pose the question like where are we going to store that so uh this may look like a rundown neighborhood but don't be deceived this is uh, trastevere uh, the most charming uh sort of a greenwich village type neighborhood in rome and this uh, um, sudden little building to the left uh, is owned by the Torlonias. Why is it so important? This is where they open the museum. In uh, 1874, uh, they opened the museum, Torlonia Museum, with 620 statues. Now, it wasn't like a public museum, only their special guests and uh, uh, archaeologists uh, would visit. They're in an amazing neighborhood. Uh, this is, for example, uh, Villa Farnesina with Raphael's frescoes and also just across the street is Galleria Corsini, uh, where Christine of uh, Sweden lived as well. These are two extraordinary museums. So that is the neighborhood to give you an idea. And what happens? Uh, uh, so the museum is open in 1876 uh, and uh, um, it was so exclusive that the famous archaeologist uh, Bianchini had to uh, disguise himself as, as a dustman to be able to lay his eye on the collection. And uh, uh, in the 1970s, so, uh, so recently, the Torlonias uh, asked for uh, permission to repair the roof. And guess what? They turned the whole building into 93, no more, no less, uh, tiny apartments. And they stash the statues somewhere, they say basement, ground floor, anyway, they have been hidden from the public eye for 50 years. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, scandals uh, with the statues, uh, Getty got involved at a certain point, uh, um, they are no longer in the, in the game. Uh, obviously, then uh, Berlusconi, a former Prime Minister of Italy offered 125 million of his own money for the collection that was estimated on 500 million. Uh, eventually, they signed a contract with the Italian government a few years ago, and finally we can see it, but then comes the pandemic. So it was open for a very brief period of time in the uh, dependance of the Capitoline Museums. This is the Capitol Hill right behind the Vittoriano Monument. And then it was closed for, for months. Now it opened again and 
I was lucky to see it uh, just about a couple of days uh, before it closed. So let's take a look at the amazing uh, collection of the collections because they were buying entire collections, not just uh, piece by piece. So here we are at Caffarelli. Villa Caffarelli is again the additional uh, section of the Capitoline Museums uh, and uh, we enter greeted by Germanico. Uh, Germanico is, uh, uh, Germanicus was uh, a very beloved uh, Roman uh, general. He was the father of um, famous Caligula and this statue was maybe made by Caligula himself, uh, but uh, it's the only bronze of the collection. The bronzes were very, very rare because especially in the urban uh, context, because they were melted for weapons and utensils for survival. And he was found in uh, Sabina, which was another uh, countryside property of the Torlonians and uh, the head, the right arm, a part of the right leg. That's the bronze painted plaster, actually. And uh, uh, Germanicus again is the only the only bronze of the collection uh, that is a so-called heroic nudity. We'll see a lot of nudity in this exhibition because the nudity was again for ancient Greeks and Romans uh, either uh, heroic or divine or athletic, and there was plenty of that. Now the tiered rows of busters uh, of, of busts and uh, uh, statues. Here, just the busts of uh, emperors, uh, uh, sometimes unknown people, but mainly alleged portraits uh, of the members of the imperial families. And you can tell they're very white. Uh, there's been a lot of polemics about uh, uh, the cleaning and restoring of the statues. It took uh, two years and it was financed by Bulgari. They've been investing the jeweler. jeweler. Uh, they've been investing a lot in, in Rome recently, and uh, uh, they were all covered with uh, with wax, with uh, with dirt, uh, um, with the remaining of the pigment. Wherever there's re remaining pigment, we try today to preserve it instead of bleaching it. But eventually, uh, they they ended up sometimes unnaturally white. But let's not be overly critical. We're also very grateful that um, we have these statues and busts uh, um, that we're able to see them. And uh, uh, the gentleman in the middle, he was, well, famous for his bad mood, but uh, that was Caracalla, the emperor who lived in the third century, and uh, uh, he killed his brother, uh, Geta, or Jeta, and ever since he was represented with this frowning forehead and this brutal force is so emblematic for Caracalla. He built the Baths of Caracalla, which are one of the amazing archaeological sites uh, in Rome, and the tip of his nose uh, was restored, as is uh, uh, common for the statues, because the, the fragile parts like noses, ears, uh, uh, the heads, they easily break off and they have to be uh, restored. Another um, famous personality here is Emperor uh, Hadrian, then uh, he's the only one who really has this prototype of the original bust because most of these busts do not have the uh, the original uh, bust part, just uh, the portrait. And uh, he has the original one, the prototype, with the Gorgon, the Medusa, who's uh, uh, the so-called apotropaic or scaring the enemies uh, uh, away. Hadrian famous for the Hadrian's Wall. For building of the of the Pantheon in Rome, uh, uh, for Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli, for so many things, especially for that amazing book uh, *Memories of uh, Hadrian* by uh, Marguerite uh, Yursenar. I hope I pronounced that well. Now the ladies are really emblematic with their sumptuous hairstyles, which were a symbol of their uh, status because the ladies did not have much choice about what they were going to, to wear, but through the hairstyle, they could express uh, uh, their importance. Because if you had elaborate uh, hair, that meant you could afford the, the slaves. And frequently, these ladies from imperial families were, well, the trendsetters of the, of the time. So we recognize the, uh, the statues actually date the statues frequently by uh, the hairstyle. This must have been a lady of high birth from the Caracalla uh, period. 
And uh, uh, another one, Julia Domna, she was uh, the wife of another emperor, Septimio Severo, and uh, she also has this incredible hairstyle. And uh, uh, behind her as well, another very modern looking, actually there are some suspicions uh, that Hadrian's mother-in-law, Plotina, who did have this kind of a hairstyle because we have another bust uh, uh, that represents her in this way, but this might as well be a modern replica. To me, it looks a lot like 1920s, but you know, who am I to say? I'm not an archaeologist. And there are two uh, really different and striking uh, busts. There is um, a bust of this elderly gentleman, uh, Eotidemus of Bactria, he's known now as a Hellenistic king, but originally uh, he was believed to be an old fisherman. Uh, this restored hat could be both, could be a poor man's uh, hat or could be a symbol of the Macedonian king power. Next to him is a lovely lady from uh, Vulci. I'll get back to her just to get a little closer look uh, at uh, uh, either a fisherman or a Hellenistic uh, king. And uh, a lovely young girl. Uh, she's not Etruscan, but it was inspired by Etruscan art and she's completely devoid of all of her decorations. Uh, um, her ears are pierced where the earrings were and there are also holes in her head. There was some decoration uh, on her on her hair and uh, her eyes are empty, obviously, because this is where the, the glass paste uh, or ivory was uh, laid to recreate the, uh, the realistic gaze. gaze. And now the gentleman who's on the cover of the of the catalog, I must say one of the most amazing catalogs uh, uh, that were produced in the last uh, few years, and uh, uh, the old man of Otricoli, uh, the realistic representation of his toothless mouth uh, and uh, uh, the, the wrinkles, uh, that places him in the Republican period, so before Rome becomes the empire, first century BC, where the, the wax masks of the ancestors were kept at home to protect the, the family. And we continue now through the halls where we see the statues that were found uh, during the excavations on the Torlonia properties, mainly 1800s, that's when this collection uh, takes shape. Here is a lovely nymph. Nymphs uh, were uh, lesser divinities of waters and she's, she's represented in this gesture of untying her sand sandal. But she's not alone. Uh, she's with the setar who's inviting her to dance. Uh, they're found in 1830s. Uh, for the first time there was a suspect from the coins that were actually always kind of together in this gesture. But uh, uh, for the first time in 1830, they were found together, these, uh, uh, these two statues. And uh, how do we know this uh, uh, young man is a satyr? Well, he has this strange expression on his face, but also the typical pointed ear. Uh, nymphs and satyrs, they're part of the processions of Dionysus, and they're very frequent in Greek mythology. But it's not, it's not just about them. Uh, there's also these very handsome young athletes. Uh, the two uh, to the left, they come from the port, from the harbor of Ostia. And um, it's difficult to say frequently what is it exactly that they're doing. So it could be like wrestling or the safest thing to say eventually is, okay, they're oil porters because they would pour oil on themselves before uh, the competition. They really are handsome young men in their perfect nudity, which reflected the perfection of the universe. But the most famous one is the third one. He comes from uh, Caffarella property and uh, uh, he's tying a sort of a ribbon that was the symbol of the, of the victors. And he goes back to uh, Hadrian's age, so second century. And most of these statues are first and second century heavily restored. A lot of integrations, you could write books about how they were restored, although not much is actually known because when that was done, not much was written about it. 
And uh, for example, if you take a look at his lovely head, it's it's a modern modern head. You can see the uh, the neck, the, the passage between the the original marble and the and the modern head. But I like it how uh, they scratched the surface to create the illusion of uh, uh, antiquity, and also the tip of his nose is actually a fake restoration to create the idea um, that it was it was antique. And now um, I, um, there is a statue that are the Greek divinities, uh, Irene and Plutus. They are the peace and abundance. Now this may remind you of the statues of, well, the Blessed Mother and the Child. Now and, and baby Jesus. But uh, in this case, the, the abundance is holding the corn of plenty, the cornucopia, with these edibles uh, overflowing and cornucopia is actually an integration. It may have been like a jug with water. We don't really know, but uh, it is probably inspired by the original statue by Praxitel from Greek, Greek sculptors, 4th, 5th century BC. They were all the rage in the Roman times. Everybody wanted to have them. And the famous uh, uh, harbor, the port, of Augustus, found in Ostia. Uh, the two main harbors were Baia and Ravenna, Baia near Naples and uh, Ravenna on the Adriatic, but Rome had uh, Ostia harbor and it was built by the, the emperors Claudius and, uh, and Trajan. And on this relief, we see the typical activities uh, of the in the harbor, the ships, uh, uh, but protected by the gods. For example, here is Neptune. You see him slightly to the, to the left. And this uh, interesting eye, which is again so-called apotropaic eyes, it protects the harbor from the evil uh, divinities. There's um, the lighthouse. Now, during the restoration, the famous lighthouse of um, Trajan's port, during the restoration, they ran into a little bit of a pigment left to see the, the flame and a tiny figure next to the flame is the statue of the emperor, while a larger uh, figure is the genius of Rome or the protect the spirit of, of Rome, while uh, to the left at the top there is the genie of the, of the harbor and the beautiful ship with the on the sails, on the sails, you can see the representation of the she-wolf with the twins, the mythological she-wolf who raised Romulus and Remus. This relief is uh, completely, completely different. It's the only Greek piece, and uh, uh, it is believed to go back to the fifth century BC as a votive relief, and that it was brought to Rome. Uh, by uh, Herod Atticus, uh, who was a Greek philosopher, 2nd century AD. He may have brought it from, from Greece because that's where later the Torlonia properties were and that's where it was found. And uh, we see a young man uh, with, um, he's holding a horse by the, by the bridle, he's followed by a dog. And then there are in the corners, like here to the right, you can see a female divinity. So it is believed that these were devotive reliefs. Now we continue with the excavations and uh, here is uh, an extraordinary uh, sarcophagus from the third century AD with uh, uh, the representation of the philosophers and the muses. It's known as the sarcophagus of a centurion uh, where this gentleman seated in the center uh, is believed to be the centurion and the lady with her face to not executed would have been the wife who must have died much later. So the sarcophagi would have the faces that would have been worked when the person died to be a sort of a, a portrait. And they were obviously a very learned uh, couple because they are surrounded by philosophers. Even the two of them are represented as a philosopher and a muse. A few more philosophers and the muses and for good measure, uh, the mask, scary mask, uh, from the Greek theater, the, the tragedy. Now, another uh, sarcophagus representing the labors, as they're known, the heroic deeds or labors of Hercules. 
the most extraordinary hero of the Greek mythology, another one of 70 illegitimate children of Zeus. And uh, there were these 12 labors and they're chronologically uh, represented. Here we start on the left with uh, Hercules killing the male lion and uh, we see that he's young, he doesn't have a beard. And as we scroll through the sarcophagus, we arrive to the Hesperid Gardens where we see Hercules after he got the apples from that tree and there's a sleeping uh, snake guardian uh, uh, on the Hesperid apple tree. Now we jump to uh, collections, two collections from the 1700s. Remember Villa Albani, uh, where there is the foundation uh, today, and this is why this vase or tazza in Italian is called tazza uh, Albani. The pedestal is modern and uh, handles as well, so is the, the rim, but it represents again the fatigues or the labors of uh, Hercules. So now for a while, we'll see the statues mixed between Albani collection and uh, Cavaceppi. Cavaceppi was a restorer and uh, he, both the Cardinal Albani and Cavaceppi, they die in 1799 and uh, they marked that, that period and a lot of the visitors again who were coming on ground tour were buying the statues in Cavaceppi's studio. He also worked a lot for this Cardinal Albani who was an avid collector but eventually had to sell a lot of his pieces because of financial, financial uh, problems. And here we see Hercules fighting the Hydra. Horrible Hydra, this is all Hera's doing. She didn't like this illegitimate child of her husband. And uh, uh, in the middle of this vase, there is a, a modern uh, Gorgon mask that was applied, modern meaning 19th century, but uh, applied to an original one uh, where the, the hair, the coils, the snake coils are mixing up with the old one in, uh, in plaster. We continue through this combination of uh, Albani and uh, Cavaceppi collections. Uh, the, um, the Villa Albani was bought by the Torlonias in 1866, so the whole collection of the Cardinal comes in their possession. And the uh, Cavaceppi collection, they bought in an auction uh, in the early 18, in the early 1800, actually exactly in 1800. So they amassed enormous amount of, uh, of art. And here is a lovely Nile from uh, Castel Gandolfo, which is today known as the, the Pope's summer residence. It was in the older times, another Pope's uh, uh, playground, uh, Barberini. And even before that, it was the villa of Emperor Domitian. So a lot of antiquities come from that area. Then there is a lovely bust of a young man who was found in Tivoli, in uh, Hadrian's villa. So some archaeologists would say, oh, well, this was Apollo or Antino, the, the male lover of uh, Hadrian, who he deified after the young man died very young, uh, he was 18. But um, later, somehow, well, this head restored by Cavaceppi, you see the eyes where there is no um, hollow shape, then it was the eyes were painted. And the identification would have been eventually attributed as uh, Ptolemy, uh, the king of Egypt, Re d'Egitto. Uh, these were the, the Greek Hellenistic generals uh, who inherited the kingdom from Alexander the Great. Even uh, Cleopatra was actually a Ptolemy. She was, uh, she was a Greek. And the two warriors, now very popular uh, in the Roman times and from, from Greek tradition, these uh, battles. Uh, there were these mythological battles uh, could be between the Giants or Amazons or the Galatians or Gauls or the Battle of uh, Marathon. Uh, they were very popular and these two uh, were not originally together. They were put together and they most likely go back to the first century AD. One of them uh, has this ancient head but with modern reworking while the other one uh, had a moustache added 
to give him a bit of a Celtic uh, identity. It was a very common thing to add attributes to a statue that may have had just a torso or just one part. OK, I will add something to give that statue some kind of identity. Kavachapi was not doing that. He studied historically what kind of statues would have what kind of attributes and what would they represent then. And in Italian, it's a, a philologico, but it doesn't really translate well in English, um, historical attribution uh, of elements. Same room, there's this lovely ram whose uh, head is an integration. It's modern, but we see who's that hanging down beneath the ram. That's Ulysses escaping from uh, the cave of Cyclops. And namely uh, Polyphemus, the cyclop that he blinded. So remember the movies uh, when uh, uh, Polyphemus was trying to figure out uh, how to keep his prisoners in the cave. So he's touching the back of the of the sheep that are leaving the cave. But Ulysses and uh, uh, and his buddies they are hiding underneath, and that's how he escaped. Now another collection now. We are jumping to Giustiniani. Giustiniani, an incredible collector, the patron also of Caravaggio, and uh, uh, he made the first catalogue with incisions. He invited uh, 30 uh, best artists engravers uh, of Europe, Flemish, Italian, and uh, that whoever studies uh, collections uh, has run into this uh, Galleria Giustiniani uh, catalogue. We can find it online, download it. And uh, these two statues, they're the so-called conversational pieces. Uh, you would put them there and your learned guests would come and say, hmm, why is Apollo holding that skin? Well, he flayed Marcia, the satyr who dared uh, challenging him in music. Well, Marcia was a, was a satyr, you see his pointed, uh, pointed ear, and uh, uh, he found a flute that was thrown away, that type of an instrument, sort of a flute, thrown away by Athena, and it sounded so well uh, that he thought he could challenge Apollo, but that didn't end well, and he ended up flayed. You can't win uh, another divinity of much, much higher uh, level. And uh, these are mostly integrations. Uh, for example, only Marcia's uh, torso is, uh, is antique. The rest is, uh, is modern. Now, this is the continuation of the Giustiniani collection, some really amazing statues. We'll get back to this lovely little ram in the middle. There are more busts uh, of the emperors. Here we have the, the bust of Scipio. We have the so-called Caesar, we're not sure. Augustus, uh, Tiberius, Claudius. Uh, sometimes it's a modern head, an ancient bust. Sometimes it's uh, vice versa. Then here we have Antoninus Pius uh, uh, on the modern bust, the uh, antique antique head, and the two modern portraits of young Marcus Aurelius uh, and uh, Lucio Vera. This is the cutest one somehow, but uh, it is most likely pseudo uh, pseudo antique uh, creation because such exaggerated characteristics were not really typical to the antiquity, although on some coins, uh, this uh, so-called Vitellius, who was an emperor briefly, uh, he does look something like that, but not, not entirely. Now, famous uh, uh, Hestia Justiniani, or Vesta uh, in, um, for the Romans, Hestia Justiniani, this is one of the of the few almost completely preserved Roman copies or replicas of the 5th century BC Greek uh, severe style. And um, the learned visitors of Rome liked to have their portraits uh, uh, painted with the statues of this kind. They're very, very popular. And the way she's done uh, with this very heavy dress and uh, um, the, the, the heavy fringe of hair and the strut connecting the, the arm with the, with the bust indicate that the original was most likely uh, bronze. And she has some stucco fillers on her face. Also Isis, uh, the Egyptian goddess, uh, restored as a series. Uh, see, there are also 
the possibilities that clients commissioned the statue and said, I'd like series. Well, at that point, you'd add some wheat if you wanted to make some money as a, as a restorer. OK, you want series. There we go. It might as well be uh, the goddess uh, uh, Pelagia, who was protecting the ships. You can find her frequently on the bows of the ships. The attribution is frequently uh, questionable. Then there's a lovely statue of a warrior. Uh, he's uh, defending himself from some blow. The head is antique, but it's unrelated. Uh, the bust is modern, the pelvis is antique, and the statue was uh, restored according to uh, a, a sketch made by Raphael. So we have some indications that that would have been the warrior, maybe the Persian, a Persian, a kneeling Persian uh, restored as Raphael's uh, sketch. There's also another uh, Medusa, Gorgon, a female face that you easily identify as uh, Gorgon because of the snake uh, coils. Uh, today we know this from some famous brands. And these two are the resting satires. It's a very, very famous uh, um, replica of an, a Greek original. There are about 100 known replicas. And uh, uh, they were frequently put together, two of them, um, to create a nice, a nice setting and a collection. And again, a conversation a piece. We have the pointed ears. And uh, again, the head is antique, but it pertains to, to the statue and probably the original was made by Praxitel, who was a 4th century BC uh, sculptor. And uh, uh, we can see also the panther, which is a symbol of Dionysus, and satires where Dionysus, uh, uh, as friends, the part of his um, processions. To see the panther, that was also heavily, heavily restored. And satires, uh, uh, have been ha having fun most of the time, chasing nymphs and getting drunk. So this is a drunken satire and uh, um, parts again restored. And the original uh, that it inspired is kept in uh, um, archaeological museum in Naples, a drunken satire, beautiful reclining uh, statue from Herculaneum. Uh, Herculaneum Pompeii, the most famous sites for whoever wants to study ancient Rome. Venus or Aphrodite for the Greeks, here we have two, and known as crouching uh, Aphrodite. Like they're two of the same iconographic type, Venus washing herself, the more famous one was from Cnidus. And uh, uh, this is uh, a statue that looks at the original from the third century BC, maybe by Praxitel, but look at the head. The head looks much, much whiter. It's a different kind of marble. It was restored by Pietro Bernini, the father of Gian Lorenzo, the one and only, I like to call him Gian Lorenzo Bernini. They both worked for Giustiniani, for the cardinal, for the, for the collection. The other Venus has her lovely, lovely head from the antiquity, probably first century AD. Now, Let's take a look at the whole room once again. And there's our Caprone or a ram. He looks so anthrop anthropomorphic. He's almost talking to us uh, because they say he was restored by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. That's why he's so, so eloquent. And he became famous later because of that restoration. Now let's continue from the ram. We pass by the boy with the goose. Uh, that is a very famous statue that you can find at the Vatican Museums, many gardens. Then uh, uh, Artemis from Ephesus, the goddess of fertility. Uh, the area of, this one comes from the area of nowadays Afghanistan. It's one of the many replicas of, of that kind of a statue. And uh, she's typical with her uh, well, how should I call these? They're not breasts, and the archaeologists eventually, art historians agreed that those are, well, uh, the truth and nothing but the truth, the bull testicles. Because this is the mother nature and the most, uh, mm, well, tasty part of the bull 
are, well, the testicles. So the peasants would sacrifice them to the divinity of fertility, invoking the same for the farm. So more children, um, healthy children working in the farm, good crops. Uh, and uh, you can find also one beautiful example at the, at the Vatican Museums. And uh, mm, Artemis was also uh, known, she was known as a mother, mother nature in the collection because you see how many different animals, uh, some mythological, are represented uh, on, the, on the statue. There are so many different pieces here. This is a lovely relief, which may have been a funerary monument or a sign where it's about, uh, well, selling meat. So it's, uh, it's a shop. Now, Let's jump to another vase called Chesi. Now we are uh, ending, wrapping up with the smaller collections uh, towards the end of the, of the exhibition as we go through it. Chesi was a cardinal, again, who had a beautiful garden near the St. Peter's Basilica. And there are some drawings that show this beautiful uh, vase or tazza uh, with this kind of a satire, not exactly this one, with the wineskin. So uh, they were like a fountain. The water was pouring from the from the wineskin. And the, the rim, again, is um, restoration. So it's this sort of satire quite, quite, heavily, quite heavily restored, while uh, the satires and nymphs are doing what they do the best uh, uh, they have. Well, they're having a jolly good time. Now, in the same room, there is a sarcophagus, again with the fatigues, uh, labors of uh, Hercules, with uh, not pertaining um, lid. These are husband and wife, but they, the heads do not even come from the, from the same period. And again, the heads were frequently missing, not just because they were broke off, because they're easy to, to damage, but uh, also because they were most appreciated at the art market of the antiquities. Let's just think about how much uh, worth there is in art. Uh, more than 60 uh, billion dollars in 2019. About 6 billion is stolen. Uh, art value of art is stolen uh, per year, and uh, that also amounts, you know, the, the black market at the at the same time. Now, here is another uh, sarcophagus, most likely third century. AD because you judge by the, the method of uh, uh, working and also by the decorations that were fashionable in certain periods and these stridulated so-called sarcophagi and uh, the lions uh, they were popular at that time lions have always been popular but especially at that time and uh, we see uh, a wild animal tamer right behind the, the lion it may have been a, uh, a tomb of a gentleman who did that for a living, or maybe he was a magistrate who organized the, the games. Venatio, the, um, the hunting of the animals that would open up the shows at the amphitheaters before the uh, gladiators duels. Now, wrapping up again the exhibition, we run into Athena, a very standard prototype of Athena uh, or Minerva for the Romans. She's there with her helmet and uh, the olive branch and all the symbol of Greece, uh, symbol of wisdom and uh, Athena uh, herself. She's in the same room with Nile. Cesarini was the name of the of the family that Torlonias intermarried with Sforza Cesarini and they had this uh, collection that was smaller than uh, the previous ones, but still remarkable. And uh, the statue of Nile uh, was restored, probably inspired by a famous statue of the Vatican Nile with little, little children symbolizing like putti, different seasons. And what is original of the statue is actually just the, the torso. And there is a statue from the uh, same collection, Cesarini, of a philosopher and Stoic philosopher Chrysippus where one piece of marble, but the head is modern and also these lovely sandals in uh, Carrara marble. So let me show you also one example of the famous catalogue that was issued in the 19th century. Uh, there was the, the first one in 1876 and then eight years later the 
uh, extended illustrated uh, catalog with 140 plates uh, that are the precursor of the photography. So we could say this is the first uh, catalog. It's, it's called phototype. It's not really the photography, but there are 140 of these amazing uh, plates. The, um, the archaeologist uh, who curated the catalog, Visconti, Visconti family had six archaeologists and uh, um, famous people in the field and one of them, the ancestor, was even called to London to analyze the Parthenon marbles. So that's how important they were. They collaborated with uh, with the Pope. They did the first catalogs just without the, uh, the photographs for the parts of the Vatican museums. So the Viscontis have been around already before the Torlonia Museum. There are all these beautiful black and white plates. And uh, Frankenstein Hercules, uh, that's a nickname, obviously. It's a so-called pastiche. It's made of uh, 112 pieces. And you um, may wonder why, why was that done like that? Well, it's not just the restoration here. It's a, sort of a showing off because a lot of the uh, sculptors and uh, uh, restorers they would work on these to sort of show off what they were capable of doing and to recreate the atmosphere of antiquity. We can see the um, uh, lion and uh, lion skin, so that's Hercules and the apples of Hesperid Gardens. The most famous statue, very similar uh, to this one, is uh, uh, Diane of Inns. She's uh, in Liverpool and uh, she's made of 120 pieces. So this Hercules came to the collection uh, in the 17th century and there was a certain taste that was uh, um, flowing through these collections. The collecting craze uh, started in Rome, at least uh, after the Pope's return from Avignon. So a lot of the families uh, uh, want to uh, stress their origin from the antiquity. They want to uh, achieve the prestige and uh, status uh, Let's not forget Torlonia's Zardo Nouveau, Nouveau Rich, but the wealthiest uh, family in, um, in Rome. And uh, um, even today, having an art collection is a uh, um, stat symbol, the status symbol. So art, as we can uh, sort of conclude, uh, art is uh, knowledge and uh, the knowledge is power. So this exhibition uh, was supposed to continue traveling in uh, in June. Uh, there were the negotiations that were stopped stopped by the pandemic. With Louvre, from what we know, uh, the two curators uh, did some lectures uh, for us tour guides in in Rome. So they also told us a bit of of a background. And also some museums in the United States uh, were contacted. But right now it's still kind of hanging in the air. And uh, the Italian government has uh, promised or dedicated the amount of about 35 million um, euro for the restoration of a palazzo, a big noble building above the Colosseum that would eventually uh, house the collection and hopefully we'll see more pieces than these uh, uh, 92 that were uh, put aside to show for this occasion. So this is an amazing, amazing chance to see something that has been a dream of all the archaeologists for decades. And even even before that, if you were not really somebody in the nobility, you could not have seen uh, these pieces. Uh, there was um, a collection in the archive in uh, Abruzzo that was destroyed in uh, an earthquake in 1915. So um, all the, they had for this catalog uh, where uh, the, was the information from the previous one from the 1800s. So a lot had to be re-elaborated and, uh, and studied again to come up with the conclusions. Frequently the notes on provenance are not clear as for many private collections, but be it as it may, this is an extraordinary opportunity. And uh, when you leave the exhibition, uh, you find yourselves in the, in the Capitoline Museums because that's the part of the whole complex just uh, newly restored and here we are in a good company. Uh, these are all the pieces, bronze pieces, except for the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius that were donated by the Pope Sixtus IV in uh, 1471 to the people of Rome, to the Senate of Rome that was on the Capitol Hill 
And that is actually the, the beginning of the modern museum. That's the, the first public collection of art and it's still there. Really extraordinary museum that whoever is interested in ancient statues, uh, that is a must, of course. There is a big competition in, in Rome. There is the embarrassment of choice. And this glass garden was built to accommodate the statue of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, most of these statues are usually not here, but he is. It was built for him. Uh, the original is in the middle of, sorry, this is the original. Uh, it used to be in the, at the Capitol Hill, but it was damaged by the atmosphere. So um, it was restored, placed here. This glass roof was built to protect the statue, extend the museum and a replica was placed at the square in the middle of the of the Capitol Hill. Here is the, the she-wolf, the um, mythological figure who raised Romulus and Remus. She's placed here on this. She's norm normally not here. She is in the Capitol Museum, but not, not in this hall. And she's placed here on this pedestal with SPQR that stands for uh, Senate and People of Rome, Que Roma in Latin. You can see that all over Rome still today, whenever there's something the, like the public lights or sewer or the you know, manhole lids, uh, you can see SPQR because that is the duty of the municipality of the city authorities uh, to take care of, of that. The statue they say it's Etruscan, the she-wolf with the twins added in the Renaissance, but some killjoy archaeologists are trying to imply that it's medieval. We don't want to listen. We want it to be Etruscan. That's much fancier. And uh, it's all observed by Constantine, a larger than life, as you can tell, statue from the fourth century, the first Christian emperor, and he's actually, uh, it's his merit that Marcus Aurelius was not melted in the Middle Ages for weapons and utensils. It's fun that uh, they're looking at each other. It's as if Constantine were telling Marcus Aurelius, well, they believed you were me, and that's why they did not melt you down. And Marcus Aurelius seems to be waving and thanking, well, thank you, Constantine, that's why I'm here. So, I hope you enjoyed the exhibition. Um, it's really an amazing uh, opportunity to see something that was hidden for decades. And the best thing that you could do if you come to Rome, and I hope you will, uh, we are very close to the area known as the former Jewish ghetto, still called like that, famous for great food. And what I would warmly suggest is to uh, end up in the ghetto tasting the famous Jewish style deep fried, double fried, crunchy artichokes. Well, thank you all very much. That's what you can do when you are in Rome. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'm here for any questions you may have. Thank you, Olga. That was really, um, as always, um, you um, never uh, never disappoint. Um, we have a few questions. We are almost to our time, only a couple of minutes left. So I think if we ask them quickly, we can maybe finish in time. Deborah Pekin wants to know what attributes of the statues are, of the statues are used to date them. Um, and in an antiquity, were statues statues, um, statues, reworked or repurposed? Is there any written record on any of them? Perhaps one of the emperors? That, that, that those are all really good, good questions. I'll try to give a relatively, relatively short, short answer. Uh, in the antiquity, we don't have the, uh, the documents telling us whether they were reworked back then. But as they started discovering them, there was this taste for completeness and beauty and perfection. So uh, they were the most famous uh, example of the of the restoration in the 1500s is in the, in the Vatican Museum, the statue of Laocoon that had like an extended arm for four and a half centuries until the original uh, folded arm was uh, was discovered. It's extremely difficult to uh, date the statue. Uh, it requires a lot of expertise. It's based on several 
elements. The first one is like the method of, of working. Uh, it's like today we look at the fashion or cars or something. Oh, that's how things were done in the 50s or, or 70s. Uh, the type of marble used, uh, the fashion, the style, and whether the marble is Greek or Roman or so, you have to go through mineralogical examination or something that's called isotopic diagrams. Don't ask me, it's something very smart. Uh, so it is really, really difficult. You go by types and uh, uh, again, the method and, and, the, and the fashion are the, uh, the most important indications. Although there was always somebody who went off tracks and did something completely different than the fashion, but usually people go with the flow and they, they want to have the same status symbols. A lot of reservation was done that wasn't documented. That, that's also a problem. So frequently you wouldn't know, was this restored by Cava Cepi in the, in the 1700s or was it restored later? If there's no written document, extremely, extremely difficult and very few written documents actually exist. Yes, I was wondering whether um, in your in your presentation, a lot of things were unknown. There were lots of unknowns, and you think maybe now that they're um, f there for public perusal, maybe there will be more studies done. Maybe we will be able to discover more as new technologies are found. Because um, it is true, it's notoriously difficult to date stone, mm -hmm. and th that's a, such a such a hard thing. Um, so. Do you think that in, in antiquity statues were, were reworked or were, were they repurposed? In antiquity, again, we don't we don't have documents, at least not from I, I know. We should maybe ask an archaeologist would be able to to tell us, uh, but uh, um, could be, you know, because there are examples of the so-called damnatio memoria, the damnation of the memory of certain mm. emperors and personalities whose statues may have been reworked to represent somebody else. Why would you throw away a good statue if you can just change the nose? So uh, it is it is possible that there are some reworkings even in the antiquity. In the Renaissance and the, and the Baroque, when the, the collectionist craze started, definitely, yes, many, many of them were reworked. Uh, you find them described as, OK, well, the um, the attributes were added to make it this or that <clears throat> divinity or, or personality. But antiquity, if that was done, I don't know very much about it. Or at least I haven't I haven't read about it. It's difficult to prove because calculate that. Consider that uh, Renaissance artists like Michelangelo, Raphael, uh, they did not have this abundance of statues to look at. What were they learning from were mainly sarcophagi. So uh, the, the time comes much later when with building, with excavations, with the whole craze for antiquities, we start running into and searching for more statues. And then we're trying to, to figure out what really happened. OK, thank you. This maybe gives me the opportunity to plug uh, the next couple of talks, uh, which I've persuaded Olga to do for the library. So in March, she's going to be showing you the art in the beautiful churches of Rome. And then my favorite and the most exciting talk so far, the two Michelangelos of Rome, which we are preparing for April, isn't it? So look out for, for notifications on these. We have actually gone over our time. Olga, you have lots of congratulations in the chat, mm -hmm. which you will be able to have a look at later. Uh, people greeting you from all over the world. A lot of Americans. Hello, Americans. Welcome. <laughs> um, so let's let's wrap up on this. It seems like a good place uh, to tell people if you are ever in Rome, um, you know who to go to, you know who you're going to call Olga Rome or dot com will get you a lot more information about Olga's work and um, some other um, lovely tours that she um, has um, on her website. Um, she runs all the social me media uh, channels, so do look her up and and um, send send her maybe your greeting um, directly. I will uh, wrap up by thanking everybody who has joined us tonight. Uh, I hope you found it in inspirational and educational. I certainly have and um, to thank Olga 
for again being so generous with her time and her pretty head <laughs> that stores so many lovely things Antique. in it. Thank you, Olga. <laughs> At least with all of these, <laughs> everyone, every also, regardless of coming to Rome or not, if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, you'll find my, my contact on my site and just ask me. I'll be really happy to, to answer everyone who contacts me, regardless of whether you will be coming to Rome. But I do hope everybody will come to Rome at a certain point. And we all hope to come to Rome. Um, thank you, Olga, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Good night. Good night, everyone. Ciao.